Hello and welcome to the Billion Dollar Broker Podcast. My name is Ross LeCane. I'm bringing my 25 years industry experience together with leading experts around the globe to give you the insights on how to live a better life and grow a profitable mortgage broking business that you are proud of. Welcome to another episode of the Billion Dollar Broker Podcast. My name's Ross LeCane. Today we've got a special guest, Cameron Perry. He's the director and CEO of Melbourne Finance and Equity Group, and also his main business, which is Perry Finance. He's been awarded the in the top 10 commercial brokers uh, for the last three years running. And with his uh, aggregated connective, he's also an award-winning broker. Uh, so welcome, Cameron. Thanks, Ross. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. Uh, so let's get started and, you know, tell us, you, you mentioned you started Perry Finance back in 2004, right? So about 18 years ago. So think back to when you started. How did you get into the broking game back then? I kind of fell into it, Ross. When we started in 2004, I started it with my older brother, Alistair. At the time, um, we'd both done, well, I'd done a commerce degree, done an accounting degree, done since uni, had sort of done a bit of travel and few jobs and we were working actually with the family property business. My father's a town planner okay. um, and also gets involved or has been involved in a lot of property sort of transactions. And we're working with him and just looking at ways of leveraging our skills, I guess, and and um, through that business. And um, we sort of landed on mortgages as something that might so I went and did my course late to around, I think it was September 2004. I just started doing some mortgage writing as a bit of a an add-on to the business, I guess, and slowly built that up over time and it, it just sort of grew. Yeah, and then it sort of evolved from there in, in various formats over the years. My brother sort of finished up around 2015, but I'm still going. Yeah, yeah. Well, I uh, was in my in business with my brother for many, many years, so... I know all about that, all the ups and downs of working with your brother. So uh, I can definitely relate to that. So looking back to those early days, what do you feel the biggest challenges were in actually getting start, uh, started and establish, establishing your broken business? Yeah, well, back then it was all paper-based. We were faxing everything off to the lenders, um, manually filling out applications in pen and then faxing it to clients to sign and things like that. So there was a, I just don't think it, there was the capacity to write the types of numbers that is possible now. But then on the flip side, that was pre-GFC. So the lending regulations were a lot looser, mm -hmm. um, I've got to say, and it was a lot easier to get things approved and through at the same time. So it was a very different time, I've got to say. But uh I mean, we, everything sort of changed after the GFC and the, the um, NCCP came in and it's a very different industry now to, to what it was then. Yeah, definitely. So in terms of getting business, how did you go about getting business back in the day? How did you start? Where, 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 where was your go-to in terms of getting business? We always had the goal of doing the development deals because that's where our client base was through the town planning. So that was kind of the the idea behind it and back in those days it was all just bank development deals and we we just we were pretty much a quasi referrer the bankers would do a lot more back then but yeah i guess we we kind of just built up our own referral so it didn't really work out that way we did a few deals for the town planning clients but it didn't really work out that way we just got on the phones got involved in various property investing forums and things like that just put ourselves out there slowly started to build up the business had no idea sort of how to run a business how to build a business back then so it was all just getting on the phones getting on the internet doing property forums joining groups just networking and just slowly build up and i guess i've kind of learned on the job how to manage a business and finally grow a business from there yeah love it you sort of you're an accidental business owner and then you get into it and 18 years later here you are amongst the, the top commercial brokers within the within the country so you know, now in terms of you fast forward to um, where you are now, um, yeah, where where is your business coming from these days? 
we've invested pretty heavily in SEO and getting our rankings up um, and also digital marketing. We've got a full-time digital marketing person in the business. And I guess that the goal there is to really have a, a reliable um, lead generation system that, you know, won't turn on and off. But I, I guess over the years, we're, we've built up probably a large referral base. We haven't had a constant referral source that we're aligned with that has given us multiple deals per month kind of thing. So it's probably evolved as a result of the types of deals and types of business that we've written that um, they tend to be the more complicated kind of commercial transactions, which just kind of, once again, that I fell into doing those, but I guess have ended up specialising in an area of finance that probably isn't as common. Um, there probably aren't as many brokers around doing those types of deals. So we've kind of developed referrals along the way from brokers, from a couple of accountants and financial planners. Um, got a couple of commercial buyers agents as well um, on board who've, and just ch tends to just um, be from, you know, maybe two or three referrals a year, but from quite a wide variety of referral sources love it so i guess you know what what is your target market you mentioned you've got someone you know focusing on digital marketing and seo who's your target who's that ideal client that you're targeting through these channels at the moment as you mentioned we've got two businesses within the group melbourne finance and equity group or mfeg which um targets property developers um it's a specialized area of finance that we've made that move to split that off as a separate business um, for a number of reasons, but um, it's a very highly specialised area and operates differently. And given the nature of property development, there's a, a big need for private funding. The banks only fund a very small segment of that market. So that's that side. And then on the Perry Finance side, we target generally commercial investors or Residential investors with multiple properties. So target the um, people who require probably a little bit more than just um, your, your regular loan advice, like a bit of knowledge around trusts and and setting up for, for purchasing multiple properties. Yeah, that's the niche we've targeted. It's disadvantages to that, that they they tend to be more complicated, but on the advantage side, they're probably found, they're stickier clients and Obviously, larger um, loan sizes on average, uh, I think, than, um, than your regular, really I guess, your, your regular broking businesses. Yeah, exactly. You know, I, I, in the, towards the end of my career, I specialised in property investment lending and a lot of complex and, you know, it becomes more around the structure than it does about the product, right? So they're That's you're really giving your credit advice and, you um, I noticed on your tagline on your LinkedIn profile, it says a highly advised, you know, a highly experienced credit advisory firm, right? So you're marketing yep. yourself as that, right? We're selling, yep. we're not selling a product, we're selling our advice. That's right. And yeah, like in finance, I guess there's competing priorities and where's a first home buyer or someone just buying the family home, it's mostly about, a lot of the products are very similar, so it's really you're trying to help them pay off quicker or get a cheaper home loan. If you're looking to grow your wealth, though, it's not there's that, but there's also um, how much you can borrow. There's how to structure it so it's mostly most tax effective. There's all different sort of um, things to take into account when you're sort of working through what the best structuring and advice is for, for those clients. So I guess you're right, the advice is the product rather than we, we obviously get the money from banks and other lenders, but um, it's less about the price of the loan. It's more about setting them up in the right way. Definitely. I speak a lot about this and it's, you know, understanding the, um, understanding your advice and what that can do and you know understanding leverage and what that can create them on wealth is going to be much more 
than it is, you know, whether you save them a half percent or 0.2 percent on a, a rate. And, yeah. and I guess the clients that you deal with understand that, right? The advice, a good advice and strategy is worth a lot more than, you know, a few points on an interest rate. That's right. Yeah, most of them do. Most of them do. And I guess from our point of view, we can also give them a bit of guidance when they're buying commercial, which mm -hmm. is a little niche um, that we have that, um, yeah, it is, it works very differently. So they need to... Well, they, they might be worth exploring because, you know, sure. a lot of our listeners wouldn't have really touched in that commercial space or they might stumble into it, right? But I know... Sure. Obviously, it's a focus of yours. So what do you think some of the keys if brokers are looking to get into that commercial loan space um, yeah. that's important, you know, coming from a top 10 broker like yourself in that commercial? What do you think is important if they were to look at uh, getting into that commercial loan space? Sure. Well, I think the first thing is they have to make the decision that they want to get into that space. So I, I think um, it is an area that you can't just sort of do a deal here, a deal there. You, it's always changing. The banks, are, they change their appetite, their criteria. Everything's changing fairly constantly. So it's not sort of a, a fixed thing that you can just say, well, oh, we do this and then not do anything for six months and exactly know what you're doing. You've got to make that call to really, this is going to be part of our business. Mm -hmm. And you, edu you have to educate yourself on it, on the products, because there's there's quite a diverse range of products with the banks. And then if you explore outside of the banks, an even more diverse range. And I think you've got to target a certain area in that commercial space. Like it, it's no one can do everything. <laughs> so you, you've got to sort of decide what are you going to target? You're going to target doctors and then you can, you know, obviously educate yourself. How do you... Yeah, what are the health um, policies of the banks? And yeah, so that, so you've got some advice that you can go to doctors or accountants and, and lawyers if you're going to target that end of the market. If you're going to do commercial property investment, which is what we primarily do, then that's a different type of lending and different set of criteria and things that you've got to look out for. So, I mean, we, we sort of um, have gained a lot of knowledge on you know, the accounting and legal side, we can't give advice, but you pick things up to just guide the customer in the right area. And, you know, you need a good sort of network of other professionals in that area as well to be able to refer your clients to. So, uh, yeah, I'd say it's either you need to make that decision firstly. You're going to get involved in it. You're going to target niches, a, a small number of niches in that market, and you're going to put in the work to, to learn about it so that you're actually offering something to the client. Uh, otherwise, you're probably better off just if you're doing well as a resi broker and don't want to do take that time, you're, you're probably better off on an ad hoc deal to just refer, it, to be honest. But yeah, it's certainly very um, rewarding if you do make that move because as I said, the, they're very interesting sort of deals at times. Um, larger, obviously, on average in terms of loan sizes so there's a lot of advantages so yeah so interested on that uh, one as your average sort of commercial deal one size. last couple of years probably been somewhere around the three mil yeah. on the commercial uh haven't got the figures in front of me but um we do do small ones we do large ones mm. you know la largest deal we've done 76 mil so they they do they get up there but um there's not a huge difference in what the the process of writing the deal whether it's 200 grand or 100 million um it's it's the same sort of process it's the same kind of um criteria that you look at but obviously um very just a few extra how, how do you find you know one of the things i hear with brokers trying to you know, get into the commercial space so how do you find the competition and what steps do you put in place to make sure that you don't lose that deal to the bank at the 11th hour because it's a lot more i guess you know in my experience you can sort of your conversion if you if you convert one in two resi you might only convert you know one in five or one in ten commercial so how do you sort of set your business up to ensure that you win more that's a good question i, I find if you deliver a little bit of value and the clients tend to understand that you know what you're talking about they 
they're more likely to stick with you. So it just goes back to what we were talking about before with the advice being the, the product. So I, I tend to try and in the initial conversation give them a pretty good overview of things to think about and hope you know hopefully most clients will get a little bit of value out of that and then you will be who they come back to because they're valuing that advice if you find yourself in a bidding war and on price on a deal they can always take it to the other bank like it's a hard because it is quite a lot of work to get to the point of even getting the pricing done it's not something where you really shop a deal around because you're trying to also manage the relationship with the banks at the same time so it's not a i don't think it's a great idea in the commercial space to be focusing too heavily on the pricing and getting yourself into that situation where you're you're bargaining on price with that you know, competitors. So yeah, that that's the strategy that I've gone with. It seems to work pretty well. So we probably have a bit better conversion than the one in five or so, but it certainly the probably the a lot of these um transactions may not go ahead for other reasons. So yeah, yeah, you do have to sort of manage that side of it. Do you charge a mandate fee or anything um in in any cases? I do on on occasion. So if you're going to do, so I I base it on the transaction and the amount of work it's going to likely to be. So um, we don't have a set policy, but for commercial investment deals, they may not, even if the la- if it's quite large, like they may not be a huge, hugely difficult transaction. We want to be the, we really want to win those. We will have them sign a mandate. We won't necessarily charge a, a fee. If we charge a fee, it'll be a small, just holding fee, a couple of grand. But if it's a for the development deals and for like a, a large or an SME business transaction, yes, we would charge a mandate fee because they can be a lot of, a lot of legwork, um, even just to get an indicative quote. It's just not sustainable to be, um, you know, moving on those uh, without charging something up front. But um, look, I, I try and deliver the value to the customer as much as possible before we get to that point. So we we know that we're going to be able to deliver something before we charge that fee. But it is necessary on occasion to charge a mandate fee. Got it. So that's commercial finance, and you you mentioned um, development as well, right? And again, development is one of those niches. And um, and again, just give us um, some of the core um, sort of skills in terms of you know what it takes to really understand uh, a development finance deal and what the different options around development finance deals are. Yeah, so development finance, you really, to avoid going down a a big rabbit hole, there's a lot of rabbit holes in development finance. I think you have to understand the way that credit look at these deals. So, and you've got to be quite realistic up front with the clients, because if you're going to do a development deal with a bank, it's got to tick a lot of boxes and 90 plus percent of deals that we see just don't tick those boxes that opens up the conversation as to if it's not going to tick those boxes if we are going to get a transaction done the cost of the finance is going to be quite a lot higher you've really got to lay your cards on the table fairly quickly and be be knowledgeable enough of credit policies to get to that point as soon in the process as possible so that you don't do all of this work and then get down to the last minute and then either the price, the you know, client just walks away because the pricing or there's, you know, you're something wrong with the pre-sales or there's something missing in that transaction that makes that not bankable. So, yeah, it takes quite a lot of, I think, quite a lot of knowledge of the credit policies that you can sort of make that determination up front and it was soon in the po- in the process as possible. Yeah, okay. So, you know, like any sort of, you know, your resi stuff, it's about knowing your credit policy and being able to win deals. This is just on a bigger scale, right? But you That's need it. to obviously understand a few more elements, you know, and, you know, some of the things that I sort of came across in, um, and you might want to expand on them, is, 
you know, how they actually work out the on completion valuation and, you know, the what they will lend on percentages of hard costs and things like that. What are the things um, that, you know, brokers need to know when, when they get a deal like this coming across their desk? There's a little bit of variance on how lenders will lend. Um, so there's the on completion value, which is the the uh, value of, let's say we, if it's residential units, mm. the value in value of the subdivided units, mm. but then minus GST. Yeah. Um, and you end up with the, what we call the gross realizable value or GRV exclusive of GST. Mm. And most lenders will have a parameter against that figure. And then you've got your total development costs, which is how much did the developer pay to buy the property? And then how much is the spend to develop it? And that includes all costs. That includes the finance costs and interest, mm. marketing costs, town planning, plus obviously the hard construction costs and anything else associated with the projects. And they'll, they'll lend a percentage of that. It's usually the lower of those two. Within those figures, there's a few slight variances between the lenders, like what's allowed and what's not. Some of the banks might take sales commissions off the on-completion value and lend against that as well, for example. They're the main parameters, and then banks will lend a certain amount. Let's say, on average, a bank deal might be 60% of the on-completion or 70% of the total development cost. If the borrowers are wanting more than that, then we have we've got a conversation to have around what are the options to do that. But mm. that it's not it's it's not a vanilla project in that case. We have to work through right. how much that's going to cost and what sort of alternative options that we have. Beautiful. And um, yeah, I think that's good. I think that's a good summary in terms of gives people an idea of. You know, what the basic parameters and, and the way that they look at it. And so then if it falls outside of that, that's when your skill really comes in. And then, you know, what are, what are some of the other things that you look at if it falls outside of that? You've got to look at the developer themselves. Like what's their asset position like? What's their experience? Have they done this type of thing before? We'll look at the the team that they've, put together in particular the builder the builders i see as the most important factor i think any um out of you know the couple of deals we've seen that have had real issues it's it's always been the builder that's caused the issues and yeah you kind of as a developer once it starts it's kind of out of your hands it's as long as the project gets constructed in a reasonable time frame everyone should be okay but if there's problems halfway through a build that's a really um dire situation to be in um so the we'd look at the builders experience and increasingly their assets and liabilities and their finances as well above maybe that might not be the case for a very small project but mm. most mm. projects we look at that and then yeah there's product market fit that we look at? I mean, if you're, is there a market for these, for what you're building? On that is how many, you know, how often do the developers required have pre-sales these days? If they want it funded by a bank, they, they always need pre-sales unless they're uh, building a small number of units and they have a very strong income. Private lending, we've, look, there's probably a bit more nervousness at the moment since the, uh, uh, rates started going up as to where the market's moving. So start of the year, we probably weren't having too many issues even with no pre-sales as long as, you know, other things made sense. Uh, general, we're wanting to see some market acceptance. So some pre-sales just to show that there is a market. It doesn't have to be a lot, anything like what the banks would require, but it's a tougher proposition now to go into a project with no pre-sales. Um, it would have to be pretty strong in other areas or potentially, you know, lower gearing or something like that to get it through, I think. Interesting. And um, the last thing you mentioned was around sort of private um, lending and private funding. If, you know, brokers haven't sort of touched on um, private funding, what do you think 
you know, to understand a private deal and, and, and a private lending, what do you think the key things that, you know, your average sort of resi broker would need to understand about uh, private lending? Sure. Well, the first thing is um, it's got to be a business use. There's no real point going down a private lending track if it's not, if it's a personal, if it falls under the NCCP, you can't really do it as a private deal. They tend to be more based on the asset. The gearing's actually potentially lower than on a home loan basis. Like we're, we're probably generally doing private deals around 65%, but obviously the the key things there are you go into a private transaction for a shorter term, so you, you need an exit. So it, it can work well where you just need to plug a gap for six months and they're going to sell a property or there's a clear way to pay back the debt, but it shouldn't be getting a client in more trouble. It should be getting them into a better position. So, yeah, there's look, they're fairly straightforward forward on the most part because they're just asset lens but you do have to take these things into account yeah you you want to be giving the client a benefit rather than getting them into a worse position which can happen in that market quite easily yeah, and give some examples you know what are the some of the things because some people look at the rates of you know, private file oh, gee that's it's an experience so if you look at some of the ones that you've done where there has been that real benefit for the client to take on this private funding give some examples of you know use cases where you know, people really benefit from from doing that some case studies for us the one that really springs to mind we we did a transaction it was a land developer bought a site for let's something like 1.6 million and were about to default on their contract and they'd paid 20% in deposits so they paid 300 and something thousand in deposits the property was worth over two they'd bought it on a 12-month contract and something had happened that they'd been let down by other financiers and we put together a solution against to, to settle the property and it was very expensive for three months. It was something like, I think it was 20 odd percent per annum, but they've secured the property, revalued it through a mainstream valuer and refinanced that debt. Um, so they've, and that property went up and up. Mm. So that's just one example that where there's a situation that really their only options were put in some money and get it settled, at expensive rates or they lose the property and they lose that potential upside. Mm. Um, so that that's one one example. Another example, I guess, of um, we, we've had to do a second mortgage on a site just to secure a, another purchase because there was a um, bit of a, a lack of cash flow for a customer. They were finishing a land subdivision on one site and had, had about three months to go, but because of delays, they hadn't been able to get the cash out of that subdivision and they were up for a settlement on another site. That obviously we, we helped them successfully get the other site. And once again, there was an uplift. So if you're paying 10, 15% even, um, sometimes isn't that much when you look at the whole transaction. Um, it's, it's a lot better than losing a property or some of these deals like where you're dealing with fairly sophisticated developers, they can make that risk reward decision that this is worth it. I wouldn't be putting any, um, you know, individuals who weren't aware or knowing of what they're doing into that type of facility. So yeah, I, I'd be pretty cautious to, to make sure that it is a benefit to the client. But yeah, certainly there's lots of situations that come up where they need a quick settlement. Uh, there's a there's just a funding gap. Often with um, businesses, there's a, a funding gap and property related debt, even at expensive rates is better than alternatives, either losing sales or perhaps going to a, one of the online lenders and paying even higher. Yeah, definitely. And this is where your expertise comes in, right? In terms of you can, they've got a need. And, you know, as you said, in terms of part of your understanding their needs, being able to really give that great credit advice will be the difference between them 
you know, potentially losing um, or, or winning on that particular transaction, right? And that's right. So, yeah, love it. Robert, I mean, it's been so much value, right, from the commercial development and um, private lending. I think, you know, from a top 10, we can see, uh, and again, I can see really from the thing I'm taking away from this conversation is, you know, how important it is to really know your craft and to double down. So whether it's you in your business or you get that specialised commercial broker in the business, yep. It's yeah. not something that you really want to um, try to tackle, you know, as a sort of add-on to your core residential business. I don't think so. And I think there's a lot of residential brokers who are very good at, you know, churning out volumes on the resi side and know what they're doing. That's great. But if it, it is an area that they're interested in, it's obviously there's a big market there as well. And it can be very rewarding, but yes, I, I agree. I, I think um, you really need to commit to it. I, I don't think it's a it's a simple add on to your business as such. Although perhaps getting a good ref broker to refer to is a an option that you can get some sort of um, cash flow when those deals happen. But if you were wanting to do it yourself, I'd suggest you know, learning about that area of finance um, as much as you can before you sort of go right into it head first. Beautiful. Is that something you're open to, Cameron? Are you uh, putting yourself out there? Is that I, I was not, yeah, I wasn't selling that for, by any stretch. Uh, that was uh, purely um, advice. But yeah, of course, if someone wanted to um, set up that sort of arrangement and, and it made sense, uh, definitely open to it so beautiful well uh yeah we'll make sure we include your contact details in the notes so uh anyone's looking they'll uh they can get in contact um and, and go from there I mean, normally uh just in closing I, I sort of ask a question and you've been in the industry for you know 18 years now so if someone was a broker and they're looking to really scale uh, their mortgage broking business, what would be your sort of final uh, sort of word of advice for them? I think they've really got to invest in, and I'm sure, um, you know, this is pretty common advice, but they've really got to invest in the systems and processes first and really take take some time to put together like a, a handbook, document all of their processes. And I think that they really need to focus on that side of things before you, you go into the growth stage of the business. So you've got to be able to transfer that knowledge to someone else and focus on how you do that. That's the hard thing to do in the, the industry. I mean, it's the, the, the secret source, but it can be done. Yeah. You just have to really focus on it. Yeah. And, you know, for somebody like yourself, um, who does a lot of complex lending, and I found, you know, this in terms of growing a, a team as well. How have you found, you know, training up staff to be able to sort of do those things that you do and be able to handle these complex deals? Where I've found, and we've we've gone through various phases in terms of staff and different roles that that we've had. What I've found has worked really well is um, getting a lot of help around different parts of the process. So loan administrators just specializing in different parts of the process. But in terms of the advice, I think you can have, if you, for the large, larger, more complex type deals, it is a little bit harder to scale probably than residential broking um, because it does take a little bit more time to train someone, but you can scale around yourself with loan administration staff. And we've, I think since we've been focusing on, you know, building a great infrastructure around the process and, and getting some really good help around loan administration, that's really helped us in terms of how much we've been able to take on and also you know probably the service that we deliver to the clients what's worked for me anyway you could have i don't think it's outrageous having three or four loan processes or loan administrators per broker so i think you've really got to surround yourself with people who can take as much of the day-to-day -day admin work off your plate so that 
you can be providing this advice. Yeah, exactly right. And I love what you said too about breaking the, the process into chunks. And I'm a big fan of that. Give them yeah. outcomes that they want and make them experts in that particular area. So whether it's, you know, doc the collection or getting um, an approval yeah. or um, post yeah. settlement, right? If you make them an That's expert right. in those areas, then yeah. you know it's a lot easier to scale, and I, I you know I love yeah. the way you said it. It's around you know you work in development finance, and it's building the foundations first, and then yeah. scaling up from there. And that's a that's a great tip. So uh, yeah. Cameron, there's been a lot of value. Thanks so much for yeah. being part of the Billion Dollar Broker podcast. Uh, I've loved having you on. Thanks, Ross, for having me. Pleasure. And if you're a mortgage broker and you are looking to scale, there's a number of ways that you can interact with us. You can join our Facebook group, which is the Billion Dollar Broker for Mortgage Brokers. Uh, you can subscribe to the podcast and any of your favorite podcast channels. If you want to get in touch about our coaching services, reach out, go to the billiondollarbroker.com.au. Uh, put an inquiry form and we'd love to see how we can assist you. Until next time, I'm Ross Lacane. I look forward to talking to you soon.